Well, it's good to see you. My name is Kyle, and I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to be with you this morning and worship with you. Um, someone a number of years ago who had been coming to church for a long time and then all of a sudden stopped and then came back, I don't know, a couple months later, when I saw her, I, I, I said, hey, how are you doing? Like, what's, go- what's going on? I haven't, I haven't seen you in a little while. And she said to me something along the lines of, I've just been really struggling, and I just haven't been my best self, you know, and I didn't want to bring that, I didn't want to bring that to church. And I was so disappointed, not in her, but in the church. This is before Tapestry Days, by the way, just so for those of you here, I'm not like disappointed in you. Uh, <laughs> I was disappointed more in what she understood the church to be as this, like, hall of fame for spiritual heroes rather than a hospital for hurting people like us. I was disappointed because she she had this idea that she had to come to church with, like, the Instagram version of herself. And that's not what church is about. That's not how you need to come to church to worship. In fact, there are lots and lots of different forms of worship, expressions of worship, types of worship in Scripture even. And one of those types of worship is lament. Lament. That's why we're doing a series during this season of Lent. Pastor Bernard mentioned it's, a se- it's the season of Lent starting today. If you don't know what Lent is, it's this 40-day period of preparation for Easter. And it's often a season where we sit in the reality of the pain and brokenness of our world and of our own lives. Something very countercultural. We don't do that very much. Even if we see pain and brokenness on TV, a commercial comes up right afterward that tells us how we can make our lives awesome. But in Lent, we sit. We lament. So we're going to be going through a series on the book of Lamentations. Now, Let me just give you real quick before Nick comes up and reads our scripture. Let me just give you a quick introduction to what's going on in Lamentations. Lamentations is a series of five poems. They're poems written in the aftermath of the events of 587 B.C. In 587 B.C., Babylon, the empire of Babylon, crushed the nation of Judah, which for a long time had been a vassal state, it had, in which, which means basically that Babylon controlled everything, but Judah was still able to sort of operate under their own auspices, under their own government. They were still able to, able to live their lives somewhat relative freedom, but they always had to pay taxes and respect to Babylon. But Judah got a little uppity in their oppression. They got a little bit rebellious, and what happened was Babylon said, we can't have that. We got to squash that, and so they did. They laid siege to Jerusalem, which in Lamentations is sometimes called Jerusalem. It's sometimes called Zion or Mount Zion. They destroyed the city. They raised it to the ground, and they exiled a bunch of Judah's most prominent citizens. That is the context of Lamentations. So then some years later, we don't know how many years later, a poet or poets wrote this series of what are really prayers. They're, they're, they're expressions of lament, which is a multifaceted way of relating to God. There are lots of different aspects to lament. There's, there's grief. There's protest. There's appeal, there's confession, there's a lot of different aspects to it. So we're going we're gonna to actually be walking through the different aspects of lament during the rest of the season of Lent. So that's the context for our scripture reading this morning. And this morning, Nick is going to come up. You can come up now, Nick, and you can read our scripture for us, which will be from Lamentations chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Good afternoon. 
starting at verse 1. How deserted lies the city once so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in the days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. And that is the reading of today's word. Just this week, as I'm sure most of you know by now, there was yet another mass shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade. I read that half of the people who were shot were children. It's a moment of acute grief and suffering for the people there, for the people who lost loved ones, for the, for the people who were harmed, and for some of us who have been in similar circumstances. But it's also a moment of sort of dull, chronic grief for many of us that ache under the the weight of the reality that this has sort of just become like normal. And we seem to either not know or not be willing to do something to, to try and change it. We have collective griefs like this that we live in. Week in and week out. Day in and day out. And we also have our our personal griefs, on top of things like, like mass shootings, on top of things like the, the war in Gaza, on top of things like, I'll name your collective tragedy, we also have our personal griefs that we're dealing with, don't we? The empty seat at our table, the job that we lost, the dreams that we feel like we have to put aside forever. Every human being, every single person on the planet either has gone through tremendous suffering or will go through tremendous suffering or both. So every single one of us needs a language grief. Every one of us. It's fitting to me that the book in the Bible called Lamentations is a book of poetry. It, it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine language for grief coming in a better form. Poetry isn't linear but it is structured in the sense of it's often, it's often structured, often help, tries to help us make sense of things. But it, as we read through Lamentations, and if you read through it straight through, you'll find that, that Lamentations frequently, like the, the authors, the poets, frequently contradict themselves in Lamentations. That's what grief is like. 
if you've ever been through it, you know that there are some days when you will say something stridently, and then there are the, there's another day that, that you would deny that same reality. And that, that way of grieving is in Christian scripture. It is given to us, as Christians believe, God's word to us in, in valid ways of us giving our words to God. So this morning, as we learn a little bit together from Lamentations, the language of grief, we're going to find three things through Lamentations. One is the causes of grief. The second is the quality of grief. And the third is the companion of grief. The causes of grief, the quality of grief, and the companion of grief. Now, the, the causes of grief, as I understand it, are basically two. Loss and love. Loss and love. One way to talk about loss is the way that Lamentations 1 talks about loss and what scholars refer to in this passage as tragic reversal. Tragic reversal. How desolate lies the city once so full of people. How great she was among the nations. Now a widow. A queen that has become a slave. This tragic reversal is, I, we remember how it was before, this wonderful reality that existed before and now not. She was a bustling city. Lamentations, by the way, um, talks about Zion or Jerusalem or the, the people of Judah as a collective, as, as a sheep as a person. And, and there are lots of different ways to read this. There are lots of different reasons scholars think that this is the way that it is. But I think one of the reasons that the poets chose this way of talking about Zion is to connect us to the suffering of the people in an intimate way, in an evocative way, in a way that, that gets right at our hearts, right where we've experienced pain. And it says that, that she, Jerusalem, the city of Zion was once this bustling city full of people and now desolate, ruins. What's a, what is a city without people? It, it's ruins. It's not a city. There, I've been to the ruins of Ephesus, this, that city where the book of Ephesians, so that Paul's letter to the Ephesians is written to. One of the Greatest cities in the ancient world. Over 250,000 people lived there at one time. One of the biggest cities in the ancient world. Now, you don't call it a city. You call it ruins. Went to the ruins of Ephesus. She lost her identity as a city. Once, she was great. She was great. And not just great like fantastic. She was prominent. She was secure. Her walls were strong. Now, widow, which is a painful word. It's a painful word for us still today. But in that time, it wasn't just painful relationally. It was also painful economically. Because in, a, in the patriarchal culture of the ancient Near East, a widow had no way to provide for herself. Her, her prospects for security, for securing the, the, her future, were, were zero. She had lost her identity, she had lost her security, and she had lost her sense of agency. She was once a queen among the provinces. She could move the pieces around the chessboard. She was powerful. Now, Lamentation says, a slave. She's lost her identity, her security, her agency. It's all summed up in verse 7, where the poet says, In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers 
all the treasures that were hers in the days of old. Isn't that just like grief? When you're going through grief, when you're going through pain, you're often brought back. Remember what it was like back then? Before it happened? Before they left? Back when I had hope? Back when there was promise? We remember the treasures that were ours in the days of old. When we go through our own tragic reversals in life. I had a healthy body. Now, not. Now it hurts all the time. I, I had a hope for my future. Now when I think about the future, it looks like an empty void. I had a, a partner I loved, and now I'm alone in my apartment every night. In a season of affliction and loss, we remember the treasures that were ours in the days of old, don't we? But grief is caused by more than loss. You know, some Stoic philosophers or, or Buddhist philosophers will teach you that the secret to getting through suffering is just detachment. It's to, it's to detach ourselves from those things that we're grieving. If we never were so attached to them to begin with, then we wouldn't grieve them so much, right? But if you're like me, that leaves a little bit to be desired when it comes to a satisfying life because grief isn't just about loss. It's about love. You don't grieve losing your college loan repayments, right? You don't grieve losing something like that. If I were to tell you that right now, somewhere in the world, someone's pet is dying, You'd be like, that's sad. But you're probably not in active sorrow over it right now, even though you know it's true. You know it's true. You know somebody is going through that right now. Somewhere in the world. But you're not actively grieving that. Because it's not your pet. If it was yours, you would grieve it, I hope. And for those of you who wouldn't, come talk to me afterward. I do counseling. Um, <laughs> Grief is caused by more than loss. It's the, it's the distress that comes from losing something you love. You might ask, uh, then, then, okay, then why am I grieving losing my job? I actually hated that job. <laughs> Maybe because your job provided you security and you love that. Or your job provided you purpose, something to do during the day. And you love that. Grief and love are intertwined, and if you just detach from it, then that means you live a life, yeah, maybe with less grief, but with a lot less love. In his book, Lament for a Son, Nicholas Wolterstorff, he describes the moment that he was thrown violently into the deepest grief of his life. His tragic reversal was he had a son, Eric. 25 years old, and then all of a sudden, not. He describes the moment that he experienced that like this. He says, the call came at 3.30 on that Sunday afternoon. It was a bright, sunny day. Mr. Wolterstorff? Yes. Is this Eric's father? Yes. Mr. Wolterstorff, I must give you some bad news. Yes. Eric has been climbing in the mountains and has had an accident. Yes. Eric has had a serious accident. Yes. Mr. Wolterstorff, I must tell you, Eric is dead. Mr. Wolterstorff, are you there? writing about his son's death. It's an excruciating book to read, especially if you've ever 
gone through the loss of somebody that you loved. He's, he's raw with his pain and his emotion. And he, he writes the preface to the current edition like 14 years later. And he says in the preface that one of his friends came up to him and said, I've given this book to every one of my children. And he said, why would you do that? And his friend told him, because it's a love letter. And he said, that's right. That's right. When asked, is, does he, is he still wounded by that loss? He says, the wound is no longer raw, but it has not disappeared. That is as it should be. If he was worth loving, he is worth grieving over. Grief is existential testimony to the worth of the one loved. That worth abides. The Bible teaches us, simply by having an entire book, not to mention dozens of psalms and other passages of Scripture, full of grief, that our tears bear testimony to our loves and that that is acceptable before God. You can come to church with your grief. Please come to church with your grief. Our tears bear testimony of the worth of the people that we've lost, the worth of the goodness of the dreams that we've had that have been dashed, the delight of the way things used to be. And the tears need to come. They need to come. Because that worth abides. And because we need somewhere to go with the pain. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, the bereaved Macduff is told, give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. We need our grief. And God blesses our grief because it deals with the quality, the intense quality of our suffering. And the quality of the grief is really a combination, I think, of pain and a profound loneliness. We see the pain in verse 2 of our passage today. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. I know I, know I told you that, the, that in Lamentations, the poet envision, envisions Judah, uh, Zion, Jerusalem as, as this woman. And so we're supposed to be thinking of this as like the city uh, having che- tears on her cheeks. And there's some beneficial reflection in that, but I just, I'm struck by how evocative of a picture that is. You can anthropomorphize a city all you want, but when you read, bitterly she weeps at night, the tears are on her cheeks. If you've been through that night, you, you cannot help but think of your own pain, your own tears, your own cheeks. There are a few nights that come to my mind. One of them is when I found out that my grandfather died sitting alone at night in my blue Toyota Camry in an empty parking lot and just hitting the steering wheel over and over. You may have your own moments as well. Maybe you're going, through, maybe one of them was last night. We cry. Because we're in pain. You know, it's, it's something that our bodies do when our bodies are in pain. Quite involuntarily. If we're in pain, if we are wounded physically, on the outside or on the inside, our bodies feel it and respond with tears. And the fact that we cry also in our grief should tell us that our pain, even if it's invisible to everybody else, is no less real. It is just as tangible, just as, as, as tasteable 
as the tears. A friend of mine once said, never underestimate the amount of pain that's in a room. Part of what makes grief, grief isn't just pain. It's a sense of, I think, profound loneliness in the pain. I'm not saying that you don't have people in your life, but I'm saying there's a deep sense of loneliness. We see this in, in, the, in our passage through the language of lack of comfort, betrayal, abandonment. Among all her lovers, there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. The people who were down to party with you weren't down to go through pain with you. The people you thought were your friends didn't call. They didn't show up. They didn't comfort. When they were with you, they sent you all kinds of signals that your pain was not welcome. That you needed to fix it before you came back. Many of us have gone through seasons of grief caused by betrayal. Many more of us have gone through seasons of grief not caused by that, but then experienced a kind of betrayal when the people that loved us, that said they were committed to us, didn't show up. There's a profound loneliness in grief that, that, that only gets lonelier when people can't be present to you in it. Some of us, hopefully, many of us here have good friends that actually would be present to us in our pain. In her book, Black Liturgies, Cole Arthur Riley writes about this moment when she sent a text message to a friend. She was reading through some journals that she had written when she was a, a child, and she came across this one line that was particularly dark and depressed and depressing. And maybe she was in that place herself. And she sent that line in a text to a friend, and she sent it with a joke, hoping not to make her friend feel like he had to do anything with it, you know. But then she said she regretted sending that text the moment the phone rang. And she writes this, I brace myself for whatever pity or awkward words of comfort he has assembled. But when I pick up, there is just silence. I don't know how to explain the difference between a silence that is judgmental or awkward and one that is tender, but when you live it, you know. We listen to each other breathing, a compassionate silence stretching out into the space between us. A few more moments pass, and he says, if you're going to keep reading, set me down next to you. He says, you, you don't have to read them out loud. I'll just be here. I'll just be here. So important. And so hard to do. <laughs> I've needed that kind of presence in my life, and I still fail to give it routinely to the people who need it from me. But it's so important. It's even literally healing just to be there, just to have someone be there with you, to have someone who is present to your pain. The problem, the problem even for those of us who have someone like that or multiple persons like that, who have dear friends or family who are present to our pain, the problem is that our pain is so persistent. It is with us even when no other people are around. And it's so personal. It's not like anyone else's. It's so unique that even when someone is with us, I think if we're honest with ourselves, many times there's still a space where we feel deeply alone in it. Henry Nouwen, in his book, The Life of the Beloved, he says, 
our brokenness is always lived and experienced as highly personal, unique, and intimate. I am deeply convinced that, that each human being suffers in a way that no other human being suffers. No doubt we can make comparisons, we can talk about more or less suffering, but in the final analysis, your pain and my pain are so deeply personal that comparing them can bring scarcely any consolation or comfort. In fact, I'm more grateful for a person who can acknowledge that I am very alone in my pain than for someone who tries to tell me that there are many others who have a similar or worse pain. Even in the best of circumstances, when you have a friend who is present, there is a limit to the companionship that they can provide. And it I don't know about you, but to me, sometimes it almost feels dangerous to acknowledge this. You know, like, like if, if we give that pain its full quarter, if we give it all the room that it demands, then maybe it's going to swallow us up. Maybe it's going to throw us into despair or, or complete devastation. So I want to share with you one more quote from Cole Arthur Riley in Black Liturgy. She says, Maybe you were taught that sadness is more dangerous than liberating. But healing comes when we are at last able to point to where it hurts. Lament is not a threat to our survival, but a means to it. It's how hope's salve knows where to go. What hope? What salve? I think the only salve and hope that I have found that has actually been a real hope and a real salve in my deepest, darkest moments is the hope of my true companion. Is the hope that someone knows my grief all the way down. And he's with me for every single moment of it. The companion of our grief, or as the book of Isaiah calls him, the man of sorrows. Isaiah, the prophet, is prophesying who we come to know in Christian tradition as the Messiah, as Jesus. And he calls him the man of sorrows, who he says is well acquainted with grief. Which is not how most of us or many of us picture Jesus a lot of the time. Right? We kind of picture Jesus like the happiest guy who ever lived. Like a big, broad smile. You know? Like the ancient Tony Robbins. You know? Just power of positive thinking. You know? Just like think your way through this. Set your goals and crush them and buy my book. That's not Jesus. That's not what he was like. I do actually think that Jesus was the most deeply joyful person who ever lived. But I also think at the same time, he was the most sorrowful person who ever lived. And those aren't mutually exclusive. Jesus was a man of sorrows, the Bible says, well acquainted with grief. And, and you know this if you've read his story. And in moments like in the Garden of Gethsemane where he tells his friends, his disciples, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever said that? Have you ever had a moment like that? Jesus has. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he hadn't even yet lost all he was going to lose. You see, the name Jesus isn't in the book of Lamentations. There's actually very little hope offered. There's a little, but only very little in the book of Lamentations. But what we do see in Lamentations is actually not just some hyperbole of the suffering that the people of Judah went through, but the actuality of the suffering that Jesus went through. 
Where Jerusalem lost her identity as a city, Jesus lost his relationship. The Son of God lost his relationship with the Father. Where, where, where Jerusalem, once great, now widowed, had lost her security, her covering, Jesus was dying naked on a cross, exposed, completely vulnerable, and destroyed. Where Jerusalem had lost agency and power and prestige, once a queen, now a slave, Jesus, the king of the universe, was mocked and executed as a common criminal. Jesus went through the greatest tragic reversal of all time. He experienced the devastation of lamentations all the way down to the dregs. The king of the universe was killed on a cross. The Messiah was murdered. The son was abandoned. And in the midst of this tragic reversal, in the midst of the tragic reversal in that kind of loss, he was also more intensely lonely than any of us have ever been. He was betrayed by his, he was rejected by his family. He, his own hometown people tried to kill him. His betrayer was one of his closest followers. The rest of his friends, his disciples, abandoned him at his hour of need, denied him when they were even asked, do you know this guy? And his enemies mocked him to his face. And worst of all, Jesus was actually abandoned by God. On the cross, he shouts out these famous words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he had truly been forsaken. And, and, and I know that some of us in this room have, have struggled with the question, how, well, okay, fine, but that was, that was a moment of suffering, maybe a couple hours of abandonment or, or, or of deep loss. I've been living with the loss that I've had for years, for decades. But Pastor Tim Keller, who died recently from procre- uh, pancreatic cancer, he he said something recently that I shared with my connect group this week that really struck me. I never thought of before. He said, the, the, the amount of pain that we experience in the loss of a loved one is tied directly to the amount of time and the quality of the connection that we've had with that loved one. So if somebody you don't know in the news dies, you don't grieve that person. If your neighbor that you've known for a few years passes away, you're sad about that. If your close friend dies, it is brutal. And if a close family member dies, it can can crush you for a while. The Son of God was in a perfectly loving, intimate relationship with the Father from all eternity. And in that moment on the cross, that connection was severed. Totally completely. The depth of that loss, the depth of that level of loneliness and abandonment, none of us will ever know. My God, my God, why? Jesus endures what lamentation describes. Worse than lamentations can imagine it. So that We, his friends, his followers, people who love him, receive him, never have to endure that utter abandonment by the Father. We never have to endure that. I know that God may feel silent. He may seem like he's abandoned you. But the truth that we have to remind ourselves of, and many, I know some of us do remind ourselves of every day, is that Jesus died so that he, the relationship with the Father for us could be secured. That means that the, the, the tears that roll down our cheeks don't only roll down our cheeks, they roll 
down the cheeks of God on the cross. He is truly with us in the pain, with us in the loss. God is with you in the grief. He may be silent now, but maybe God's silence isn't the silence of disinterest. Not the silence of abandonment. Maybe his silence is the silence of a companion who knows when to be quiet. Who knows that words in this moment will just cheapen your pain. The wounds, that the wounds would only be driven deeper and that the only comfort could come with just simple, loving presence. Maybe, maybe the silence of God in the moments of our grief is really just God, our companion, our Father, who will never abandon us, saying, I'll just be here. Set me down next to you as you go through this. You don't have to say it out loud. I'll just be here. And when we sit with Jesus in our grief, when we let him sit down next to us, our grief, you know what it does? It drives us deeper into his arms. It drives us deeper into his arms. It drives us deeper into the love of God. I can tell you from my own experience that in the midst of pain and grief and sorrow, there are glimmers and even sometimes great waves of joy that come from grieving with Jesus. Not all the time, not every day, but it happens. As Tim Keller writes in his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, he writes, the joy of the Lord happens inside the sorrow. It doesn't come after the sorrow. It doesn't come after the uncontrollable weeping. The weeping drives you into the joy. It enhances the joy, and the joy enables you to actually feel your grief without it sinking you. For a Christian, for someone who knows that their relationship with God is secure, that their Father is with them even if he is quiet, our grief can drive us in to his arms, drive us deeper into the joy so that joy can mix with sorrow. As you give space to your grief, friend, I encourage you to allow Jesus to enter that space with you. He has experienced the full depth of loss, the full pain of loneliness, so that you will always have someone with you who is truly with you in your grief. Let me pray. In fact, right now, let's just take a moment to be silent with God. The God who says, I'll just be here with you. Father, we are grateful that you are not a God who, demanded, who demands that we fix ourselves up before we see you. You're not a God who gave us a scripture full of cheap platitudes, but broken-hearted poetry to describe our pain. Jesus, I pray that you would simply be with us. As I know you are, simply be with us. 
as we're going through what we're going through. I pray that that turns us into people, into a church that are more able to hold our grief and the grief of others without it sinking us or scaring us. Because we know that the sorrow comes in the, that the joy comes in the midst of the sorrow. God, we pray for anyone in here now who's in the middle of an acute grief or deep into a long chronic grief. Be present with them, God. Be there with them. Help them to know that you will never abandon them, that you see them. In Jesus' name I pray.